In this week's video we're going to look at some simple circuits. We're going to look at how to lay out your batteries. We're going to look at fusing factors for fuses. We're going to look at cable sizes. We're going to look at lug sizes. The different types of fuses and breakers. We're going to tell you about do's and don'ts so that you have an understanding of 12 volt systems and how they work. Enjoy the video guys. Hope it's of use to you. So let's start right at the beginning with battery layout and terminals. Generally there are two types of battery layouts when it comes to terminals. They can either be fed from one end or from both ends. Over the years different manufacturers have used different types of stud or terminal. Most leisure batteries are now using either AP posts or stud type terminals similar to those used on lithium batteries. Most lithium batteries have an 8 or 10 mil threaded socket on the top of the battery or a stud. My opinion is that these, if set up correctly, have a much bigger surface area of contact and result in less heating up or resistance at the terminal. The makeup of the cells within the battery lends them to having the terminals at one end. In fact, this is one of the batteries we've just bought for our camper van and both the terminals are 8 mil and at one end. OK, let's look at the layout of your batteries. Modern batteries are coming in bigger and bigger sizes, 2, 3, even 400 amp hours. With solar panels becoming more and more effective, people are tending to use more and more power and setting up their batteries in 2s, 3s, 4s, even banks of 6 or 8. Let's first look at batteries in parallel, there's an important thing to remember, or well, a couple of important things to remember when setting up your batteries. Connecting batteries in parallel increases the amp hour capacity of the battery system while keeping the voltage the same, as in this diagram here. In this setup here, four batteries, each having 12 volts, 100 amp hours, and 1200 watt hours, produce a total of 400 amp hours or 4800 watt hours at 12 volts. As we said in a previous video, it's the watt hours which are a proper measure of the amount of power you have in total. Let's look now at batteries in series. In this diagram, four batteries are set up to produce 48 volts, four times the voltage but the same capacity. Connecting batteries in series increases the voltage of the battery system without increasing its capacity. This is done by connecting the positive terminal of one battery to the negative terminal of the next battery and so on until the batteries are all connected. And here you can see our four 12 volt 100 amp hour 1200 watt hour batteries now produce 48 volt that's 4,800 watt hours. And free is one of my favourite words. Now again, we've said this in a previous video, but just connecting your batteries in parallel will cause you problems because of the resistance of the conductors you're going to use. In one of these books it shows you exactly the best way and the most efficient way to connect your batteries when connecting them in parallel or series. 
it's very important that during charging and discharging your batteries, the same amount of power is either being taken out of all of them or put back into all of them. Otherwise, the batteries can become out of balance. Again, those documents from Victron make good reading and explain this in more detail. So let's look at fuses and breakers. Fuses are basically a weak link in your circuit. Primarily, fuses are there to protect the cabling from overheating or too much current being drawn in that circuit. Many circuits have their fuse fitted here immediately after the battery bank, but this only protects the cabling and circuit after the fuse. Positions here and here are not protected. The same applies if you fit a circuit breaker. Only the circuit after the circuit breaker is protected. In larger battery banks, especially those with lithium, we believe it's much better to fit the fuses as near to the battery, if not on the battery, such as here, here and here. Now, of course, you could do this with circuit breakers, and we believe that the fuses are a much better solution, and it's tidier, makes for a more compact design. We also prefer fuses. We've seen circuit breakers that have not tripped out and nearly caused fires, so we tend to use fuses. And of course if you're using individual conductors or wires of the same length to keep all your batteries in balance, then it's more likely that you will want to protect each individual conductor rather than this conductor here only. Putting the fuses in this position also helps to protect the BMS inside the batteries. Wherever you put the fuse, remember that it must be sized in accordance with the cable it's there to protect. For example, this cable here is much bigger than the four preceding it at the bus bar. Therefore, the fuse protecting it must also be bigger. There are hundreds of fuses available on the market, and breakers too, but we prefer this type. They fit at the terminal whether you've got lithium or conventional batteries and this enables, as we said before, the battery cable to be protected straight from the terminal. Whichever type of fuse or breaker you decide on, make sure it's of good quality and from a reputable source. There are plenty of charts and data on fuse sizes and cabling. There's even apps for your phone which will tell you what size fuse or cable you need but it's something you should be aware of. Not all fuses are created equal. All fuses and breakers have what's called a fusing factor. I'll give you a couple of examples. Fuse wire is typically a fusing factor of 1.5. So a 30 amp fuse actually blows at 45 amps. Cartridge type fuses, especially those of high quality, can have a fusing factor as low as 1.2 or even 1.1. The fusing factor of a fuse is the ratio of the minimum fusing current to the current rating of the fuse. Let's put that another way. The fusing factor is the fusing current over the current rating of the fuse element, or minimum current causing operation over the rated current. Or in other words, you simply times the current rating of the fuse by its fusing factor to give you the actual current at which it will blow. That makes more sense, doesn't it? Circuit breakers have a fusing factor too, and it's usually quite low. The technical specification for your circuit breaker will tell you what the fusing factor is and how many milliseconds it takes to trip out. Let's look at cables and crimps. There are several ways to measure the size of cable. In America, they use American wire gauge, or inches. American wire gauge and inches are based on the diameter measurement, as well as millimeters. However, CMA and millimeters squared is a cross-sectional area of a cable. Conversion charts like this one are available as wall charts that you can put on your fridge or on the wall in the workshop. It's pretty important that you know what you're working with. For example, I recently did a job where somebody had sized their cable in millimetres diameter, but the calculation for the instructions had been done in cross-sectional area, millimetres squared. 
there's a big difference. You can get apps for your phone or look up on the internet what the maximum cable run you can have in any particular size for the amperage that cable is having to carry. Hardly anyone does the calculation longhand anymore using the resistance per meter in ohms for that calculation. Cable crimps or lugs are similarly sized, either in AWG or in cross-sectional area. In Europe we tend to use cross-sectional area, but there are some crimps and lugs which come into the country using AWG. The connection hole in the lug or crimp is also sized either in imperial or again in millimetres diameter. Again this information is readily available on the internet and you can download tables like this one. Or for the smaller lugs and crimps, tables like this. Again, make sure you know exactly the size of cable and lug that you need and how many amps it's going to carry. Whichever size cable, fuse, lug, breaker or crimp you're going to use, must emphasize you need to buy quality products if they feel lightweight or cheap they are and it could cause a fire so always go for quality rather than price so let's look at a few other basic connections you're going to make the first thing you're probably going to fit is a shunt this measures power in and power out volts amps watts battery state of charge time to go total cycles and normally they measure two batteries. Importantly they usually measure the current you're using or charging in amps. Shunts always fit in the negative line of your power supply so it's the very last thing in the circuit before your batteries or power supply. The shunt should be capable of handling the total amperage which your batteries or power supply may end up providing. This includes an inverter, which have a very high amperage draw. The same thing applies to your bus bars. They must be capable of taking the full current, which may be flowing in that circuit. Whichever way you decide to make your battery connections, the same rule applies. And remember, the large cables for your inverter are going to come directly from those bus bars. So a few top tips for direct feed items. There will be a few things in your electrical circuit that need to be direct feed. For example, the supply to your bilge pump. This needs to come from a direct feed from the batteries so that when you turn your isolator off, the bilge pump will still function from the batteries. And you'd need this, for example, when you leave your boat. Remember, these direct feed items also need to be protected with a fuse, like this one here. Your battery monitor will also need to have a direct feed, one from your engine battery and one from your domestic batteries. Both of these need to be fused too. Other things that need a direct feed may be, for example, your diesel heater to prevent it being turned off while it's still very hot, or the memory for your radio. Again, anything that has a direct feed and doesn't go through the switch panel must be fused. And remember, this also applies to your inverter and your solar or battery charger. Well, I hope that video has been of use for you. In fact, all three of the videos in this series. If you need more help, you could always become a patron. We're always available to patrons to help out with any of their technical issues. And for the cost of a pint of beer or a coffee once a month, you can't really go wrong. So pop over to patreon.com and look up SV Impavidus. You'll find us there. Or you could just buy us a beer. Or give us a like and a share. Every little helps. Just subscribing or putting a comment down below really helps us out. Don't forget, all of our links, including those to our website, and our shop are in the description below or go to www.svimpavidus.com Until next time guys, sail safe.